Now for something uh, completely different. Appearing on the screen near you is an image of Pippi Longstocking. Uh, we have a Pippi Longstocking uh, figure in our midst here. It will be Kathy Richardson. Is our own personal Pippi Longstocking. And um, fortunately, Kathy is fluent in Swedish and many other languages. So um, I, I've asked Kathy if she wouldn't, as an introduction to the Stockholm Syndrome talk, which is about Sweden, if uh, she wouldn't come up and sing for us in Swedish the Pippi Longstocking song. Just the verse. Just the verse. Oh, okay. Okay. And, and yes, it's here. I know the Longstocking I'm going to be talking about. Uh, this is Christine Enmark. Um, she is the first person in the world ever said to have Stockholm Syndrome. And um, she lives in Stockholm still, 42 years later. Um, it'll be 42 years in August um, since the hostage taking in central Stockholm. Christine Enmark, she works as a couples therapist. And um, I've, I've been talking to Christine um, for the last couple of years <coughs> about the experiences of the time and um, the whole notion of Stockholm Syndrome. And um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about those events. And um, we're going to untack the notion of Stockholm Syndrome. And uh, the reason I want to do this is because the un a lot of these victim-blaming notions like Stockholm Syndrome, traumatic bonding, learned helplessness, repetition compulsion, et cetera, et cetera, they're very much uh, threads in a fabric, so to speak. They're woven all together so much, so that, and they gain strength from one another. So in um, looking again in a different way at the whole notion of Stockholm Syndrome, um, what I'm also trying to do is to look again in another way and provide a model of an analysis that allows us to take apart the whole fabric. That, that's kind of the idea. Is, is that clear? So. It ain't necessarily so. That's uh, Christine and Mark uh, after a six, six and a half day hostage taking. Um, let's go on. I'm telling you. Why is it so hard? Does that work? Yeah. Ooh, very tinny, eh? You up? There? Okay. Six and a half days. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the events. But there she is on a stretcher, and we'll come back to that photograph, because that's quite a moment for her. That's a very indignant, very angry, very traumatized young woman, um, who in a few hours is about to be told that she has Stockholm Syndrome. So remember that map? Gave you yesterday. So the these events are um, looking at these events in a way through this map. So um, meeting Christine and Mark. So I've been going to Sweden for about 15 years pretty regularly. And um, the last few years it's been uh, basically twice a year. And in doing that um, I've had the really good fortune of meeting wow I've always had this effect on technology. Is it back on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
Um, meeting a, a lot of activists and uh, a lot of feminist activists, men for gender equality, who are also feminist activists. And um, so they, one of them, a uh, couple of them, who've been sort of participating in training with me for a while, um, put me in touch with Christine Enbach. And uh, this is one of the troublemakers in Sweden. Her name is Hannah Olsa. Uh, Hannah is very well known in Sweden because um, um, she wrote a book about 20 years ago. What had happened was um, a criminologist and a medical doctor were found guilty in court of dismembering the body of a prostitute. They were not found guilty of having done the murder. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? But um, she wrote a book documenting really clearly why they should have been found guilty. For doing the murder, it became a, a huge bestseller in Sweden. She was given several honorary doctorates. She became kind of a household name, uh, quite a figure in Sweden. And uh, she's paid a huge price for that because um, she's been getting uh, regularly attacked by these men and um, other men connected to them who are really powerful people with a lot of money for many years. To the extent, for example, that last year, part of private counseling records uh, going back to her childhood, where she was talking about some very personal things, were, were uh, obtained and put in a newspaper, published. So she's been getting attacked um, by right-wing men's organizations for 25 years for having told the truth, basically. One of the things she did after this, uh, Hannah has done a huge amount of work on what they call the prostitution question in Sweden. Um, it was well known that many powerful men, men in uh, elected officials, parliamentarians, were regularly using prostitutes and had actually hired people who were paid for by government to find them prostitutes, um, including Olaf Palme, who was the, still a god in Sweden. So you have to be really careful about saying that, but uh, that's, that's what the women on the street say in Sweden. So um, she got involved in the prostitution question, and, and uh, to hear Hannah tell it, she asked two really good questions. So she went to talk with uh, sex workers, prostitutes. All of that language is problematic in some way, shape, or form, isn't it? So she went to talk with women who were doing prostitution, and she asked them the question, what is prostitution? So, Which is a pretty damn fine question, because it got them into talking about what they actually do. And the women said things like, prostitution, that's when a man pays you to masturbate in your body. And what was really striking about the accounts that she reported from the women she spoke to is they did not talk about it in sexual, erotic, mutual, intimate terms at all. Of course, Johns talk about it as sex. Now, a lot of sex workers, prostitutes, would talk about it that way. This group of women did not. So it doesn't mean we can conclude from that, that but that's pretty striking. There's a same gap between how the Johns talk about it and how those women talk about it is the um, same type of gap is visible between comparing the experience of, ch of children who are assaulted in sexualized ways and the ways in which that's talked about by judges as sex and intercourse. We have the same massive gap between the facts and the language used to talk about, which we'll talk about later today and tomorrow, I guess, right? Will, maybe we'll talk a bit about that. Okay? Yeah, okay. Okay. So, um, and then she asked another question which was, what don't you do? Which is really a question about resistance, eh? So they don't kiss. They don't get involved in intimate things. They think about their kids. You know, things like that. Again, not the kind of answer you'd expect from people who were trying to participate in an erotic activity or a mutual activity of any kind. So um, she wrote some really good papers on the prostitution question. A lot of you have heard about the Nordic model. Uh, some of Hannah's work is behind that. So I've got to know Hannah quite well. She's an activist, um, just wicked fun. And um, we, we sit on her balcony in Stockholm and uh, swap lies and drink wine and talk about stuff. It's, it's a lovely thing. She's been a huge help and uh, really, really supportive. And uh, at some point, she decided that Christine and Mark and I uh, would enjoy talking to each other. I didn't know she knew Christine Enmark. She didn't tell me that until one day she said, oh, by the way, um, I've been talking with Christine Enmark, and she'd like to meet with you. I, Christine Enmark, she goes, yes, Stockholm Syndrome. I said, oh, you mean 
the person who has dropped stuff up, she goes, yes. I go, oh, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. Why? <laughs> you know, so I just think you guys would have a good conversation. So um, she set it up, put us an email contact, arranged to meet with Christine at a Wayne's coffee shop, which are all over Stockholm, down on the bottom, near where I was staying. So I go over to the coffee shop, I'm there before her, she comes off the uh, Tunnel Dana, the underground, and, um, you know, sees me in the coffee shop, comes to chat with me for five minutes, I think to kick my tires, is this dude kind of okay or not? And uh, we chat for a few minutes, and then she goes, well, why don't we go to my office? So, okay, so we walk across an alley, 15 feet, where her office is. So, you know, she had a plan. She doesn't come unprepared. <laughs> So uh, we go up to her office and sit down in her couples therapy office. And uh, she says, uh, why did you want to talk? And I said, I don't really know. Why did you want to talk with me? <laughs> and she says, are you interested in Stockholm Syndrome? <laughs> and I said, well, actually, I've always been a little bit suspicious of the idea. And she says, me too. <laughs> <laughs> So three and a half hours later, I leave her office, and um, it's just one of those conversations. You know? So we've been in touch, uh, chatting since then. Um, but after meeting her, I had some real questions come up in my mind about ethics. And I use the word ethics um, because, um, you know, here you are talking to this person who for me is one of the most famous and least understood people in the world certainly in psychology and psychiatry. And um, I was talking to a couple of colleagues in Stockholm about this, meeting with Christine, and one guy says to me, wow, this is big. So what's he thinking about? He's thinking about career. He's thinking about money. He's, you know what I mean? And so I noticed in the moment, I thought, yeah, that's right. That's right. So, uh, so I talked to Linda, I talked to Vicky, I talked to, you know, um, Christine wants me to talk about this publicly. Should I talk about this? If I'm going to talk about it, where and how? Is that really my place to do that? For reasons that you'll see as we go along, because she's had enough being talked about uh, by men. And particularly, though, men who have never talked with her. None of the experts in the world on Stockholm Syndrome have ever had a conversation with Christine in life. So we have there a rather, talk about colonial, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me? Sorry? <laughs> yeah, okay. So, <laughs> wow. <laughs> We've been working together too long. <laughs> so, um, so then I had an experience in Perth, talking about this. Ask permission if I could talk about it, set my PowerPoint slides. This is what I think I would like to say in Perth. So I met a gathering of mental health professionals in Perth, and um, about 40 women, no men in the room. And uh, so I start going through this talk and um, looking at this in a slightly different way. And then a woman bursts out crying, sort of, I think Robin would say projectile tears. I think I would have it. Correct me from you, Perth. Boom, she leaves the room. Another woman goes with her. And I'm thinking, oh shit, you know, what have I done? What's going on? Keep on talking. And, um, yeah, if in doubt, keep on talking. <laughs> <laughs> she comes back 15 minutes later, and uh, she's like blown. And she sits down, and I'm going to carry on because I don't want her to, you know, feel sandy out or whatever. So she says, Would you mind if I tell people why I left? I said, No, that's okay. So she says, um, I just, I left my husband really, really violent guy about five years ago, but we still got a whole bunch of property issues, and it took me a long time to get away, and I can't get a divorce yet, and it's really pissing me off, and I was talking to my lawyer last week, and my lawyer says to me, you know, maybe that's why you stayed with him so long. Maybe you have Stockholm Syndrome. Maybe you have Stockholm Syndrome. Maybe you have Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> so she says, 
So when I so when when you started talking about how that actually doesn't make any sense at all, suddenly I realized there's nothing the matter with me. And she burst into tears. So then I thought, okay, I got to talk about this. So I wrote an email to Christine and told her what happened. And um, and then I got a. I forget if I've tried this one. <laughs> <laughs> this one has the green light on and doesn't work. Sorry, you guys. <laughs> yeah, I think this one's working for a while. Um, then I get a um, then I get a email from a guy in Australia called Ian Johnson, and Ian has just heard a who I've been talking to a little bit about this, and he's just just heard a radio program on Australian Broadcasting Corporation where an international world expert has been talking about Stockholm syndrome and saying some things about Christine and Mark that I happen to know are not true. And he's been that he's been making his living off talking about Stockholm Syndrome for a long, long time. So he sends me the interview. And I get it transcribed and I'll show part of it to you as we go along. And so I send Christine the interview and she goes, You have to challenge him. So that's why I'm talking to him. So what's Stockholm Syndrome? Basically the whole notion that people develop um, really affectionate, positive, warm feelings toward a kidnapper or a, a hostage taker. And um, maybe even negative attitudes toward authorities. That's in a nutshell. It's connected to all kinds of other theories. The reason I want to talk about it a little bit, this one is also, oh, it is working. <coughs> also, I want to talk about it because Stockholm Syndrome is one of many, many theories about the minds of violated, oppressed people. And we in the mental health professions and psychology, psychiatry have been making up theories about the minds of oppressed people for many, many years. We're really, really pretty shitty at it, but we like to do it apparently because it's it's kind of epidemic. We've been doing it for a long period of time. So I think we need to really be careful about theorizing the oppressed. Um, that's a really um, sort of problematic notion in a way. Um, so here's a little bit about the cultural roots of I'm not supposed to talk about this. I, I should sit down and shut up. Okay. So, where does this idea come from? The idea of identification. Normally, in child development, children um, identify with their parents and they internalize their parents' values. That's a normal psychosocial development. Um, so the notion, the metaphor of internalization is very common in our field. Have you heard, you've heard people talk about how other people internalize ideas, internalize ideologies, you internalize a sexual script, you internalize the oppressor's ideology. The internalization metaphors, which I think are really problematical metaphors in lots of ways, are very commonplace in our, in our field, internalization. So then along comes Anna Freud, and she writes a book about, in which she talks about identification with the aggressor. She invented, invented that notion, and all of the examples she writes about in her book about that are all children. So it, it's a really interesting kind of chapter. Now, it was picked up from there by Bruno Bettelheim, who applied it in a very different way to the case of um, Jewish prisoners in the Nazi concentration camps. And Bettelheim observed that um, not, or, sorry, Jewish prisoners who were told to kill other Jewish prisoners or they would be killed. He noticed that when they killed the, the other Jewish prisoners, fellow Jewish prisoners, with guns, they mimicked the actions of the Nazi guards. He concluded, therefore, that they had internalized the ideology of the aggressors. Uh, of course, there's a, a simpler explanation, which is that if you've never mass murdered before, it would only make sense you'd copy someone you'd seen do it. Uh, but anyway, so that, that became the explanation. Uh, and of course, it's also tied in with Marxism in an interesting way, because you know the idea in Marxism is that capitalism is inherently oppressive, therefore the proletariat will rise up in large numbers uh, and revolt. That's basically the notion. But Marx had a problem in his theory. It lacked predictive validity in that the, the proletariat did not seem to be rising up and revolting in large numbers uh, anytime soon. 
So like many academics since, uh, instead of uh, revising the theory, he decided to revise the oppressed. So what he said was, um, oh, the reason that they're not rising up in large numbers is no problem in my theory. The reason is because they have a false consciousness. They've been gulled, they've been duped, they've been tricked into thinking that capitalism is delectable. So therefore, what we have to do with people is help them get a critical consciousness. You've heard that term? Critical consciousness? It's about consciousness raising? Straight out of Marx? That's that whole kind of logical... And keep in mind here, what you're saying is, oppressed people have internalized the ideology of the aggressor. That's why they don't resist like we think they should resist. Right? That's why she doesn't leave the guy. That's why the Poles don't revolt. Same logic, same argument. They're, they're linked together. So you have this intersection of Marxism and psychoanalysis in a really interesting way. So all of these uh, constructs here, maybe I'll move over here. Maybe the microphone will work better. <laughs> um, infantilization, internalized depression, the Uncle Tom syndrome, <laughs> the self-hating Jew, Traumatic bonding, enmeshment, codependency, repetition, compulsion, repetition, compulsion, compulsion, <laughs> repetition, <laughs> lateral violence. <laughs> women choose unconsciously attractive use of men. Battered women syndrome, cycle theory of violence, weird helplessness. They are the same thing. They are the same argument. Um, same leopard, different spots. Uh, but they originate culturally in the same place. Paulo Freire, who's, of course, wonderful. And a great activist, uh, because of their identification with the oppressor, they, the oppressed, have no consciousness of themselves as persons or as members of an oppressed class. So what, what we have here are quite powerful, privileged, educated people making up theories about the conscious and unconscious mind of literally hundreds of millions of people uh, with apparently no ethical problem. You know, thinking, is that a, you know, so... Um, Antonio Gramsci, the reason I put these up is because they were current at the time. 1973 was the hostage taking. So what was floating around ideologically in the air? Gramsci, right? The act of man in the mass has a practical activity but has no clear theoretical consciousness of his practical activity. This contradictory state of consciousness does not permit of any action, any decision, or any choice and produces a condition of moral and political passivity. So, uh, you know, you don't get a lot of accounts of victim's resistance in child protection case files. Same thing. Same argument. Cycle theory of violence, the batterer spurred on by her apparent acceptance of his abusive behavior does not try to control himself. The passivity of the victim, of the victim is the catalyst for the aggression of the perpetrator. That's the logic. During the first stage, the woman tries to calm the abuser and often changes her lifestyle to avoid angering the man. This usually sets a precedent of submissiveness by the women, building the gateway to future abuse. She's the perpetrator of her own misfortunes. He's the victim of forces he cannot understand nor control. So it reverses the position of victim and perpetrator. And this is standard fare. We're still teaching this in schools. We're still teaching it to people all over the place. We're teaching in the context of feminism as well, these kinds of models. Flat out woman blaming, flat out collusion with offenders. So the cycle theory of violence became so popular because it failed to question the status quo in any meaningful way. It provided a bridge for patriarchal, colonial, male psychiatry and psychology to be applied to the new phenomena of violence against women. So I won't go there. If you look on the internet to get images of Stockholm Syndrome, you get things like this. You know, Stockholm Syndrome, Beauty and the Beast, Right? Women really want to be dominated, actually, and the more aggressively, the better. If they say no, it's, that's, you know, they really want to be, you to be more aggressive and uh, bring out the beast in you, and that's when women really feel loved and on turn, right? That's the whole notion. Um, you can also get this kind of stuff on the net, Stockholm Syndrome. So you get this kind of childlike body dressed up in, you know, this kind of child fuck me pose. So you get a lot of that kind of weird shit. Um, attached to Stockholm Syndrome. So you can begin to get a sense of where this cliché, article of truth, fact, has somehow gone. What, what does this cliché become now? In terms of how we think about women and how we think about sexuality, and how we think about intimacy and violence. So here's Frank Ochberg 
and uh, he's talking on um, Australia Broadcasting Corporation. So he's talking to a guy called Michael Vincent, who's kind of like the Anna Maria Tremonti uh, of Australia. And so he's talking about violence, uh, sexual abuse. So Michael, it's going on in a different, apparently more normal scenario. If the girls don't leave, they can't leave. They're traumatized, abused, and infantilized. This notion of infantilization, straight out psychoanalysis. You get infantilized, and what do you want there for? Basically, you want your mother. Yeah. So you, you behave in a childlike fashion toward the person who's offending against you. You have that traumatic bond uh, because you're a child, and you're looking to them as an adult to look after you. This is kind of the notion. Then he goes on, they're made into domestic creatures. By domestic, I mean the way we train pets to obey. So in all of this stuff, you never find any recognition of the fact that people spontaneously respond to and resist violence. Trauma-informed care perpetuates that false stereotype. That's not a small problem. So then he uh, goes on. Let me start with the Stockholm Syndrome. This is a situation in which suddenly, out of the blue, an otherwise normal person is held hostage by a criminal. Uh, within a matter of hours, the hostage is treated like an infant and has a kind of regression to an infantile emotions. Uh, they can't eat, they can't talk, and then they go on. To do so risks death, and they accept the feeling that this is the giver of life, just like my mother was. Yeah. And then he says this, and this is what really pissed Christine off. <laughs> Sometimes, depending on the age and gender, it was sexualized. That happened in the original Stockholm case. Christine had sex in the vault with the assailant. No, she didn't. Nothing even remotely resembling the plumbing that could be called sex. So uh, she thinks she knows what happened. But that's, so that's one problem. But think about the deeper problem here, is you have an international expert presuming that sex could occur in that context with a rifle pointed at you. What are the options for consent there? Could anything like sex ever occur? So you begin to see the kind of layer upon layer of distortion uh, that's been getting marketed as um, knowledgeable psychology and psychiatry. So the timeline, 1972 Munich Olympics, hostages, uh, Israeli athletes are murdered. 1973, Stockholm, the Stockholm Syndrome case. 1974, Patty Hearst is kidnapped. 1973, I graduate from high school, amazingly, against all odds. <laughs> you know, I'm working at the liquor store in August. Christine Enmark is uh, being locked up in a bank vault. So, you know, she's 23 years old at that time. Uh, 1979, the cycle theory of violence, battered women's syndrome is invented. 1980, PTSD is invented. Uh, so all of this stuff kind of occurs in an interesting, 1981, the rise of culture of trauma. There's an interesting sort of progression of notions. Uh, across these various locations. Sweden is a small country. There are no SWAT teams. Police forces don't have SWAT teams. They've never had big hostage takings. They don't know how to respond to these things. Sweden's a tiny country. They have one television station. The Social Democrats have been in power for 30 years. Uh, Olaf Palma is a hands-on guy. There was a, there was an, um, what do you call it, a hijacking of an airplane two years previously. Olaf Palma was put on the radio and negotiated with the people who hijacked the airplane. The Prime Minister of Sweden. So he's like, talk about micromanaging, right? Takes that to a whole new level. <laughs> so he's a, he was known as a strong man, you know, like a, this kind of a figure. He got involved in uh, all kinds of people's daily affairs. Uh, and, and, it, and it gets really interesting. It's, it's, it's election time. King Gustav is dying. Police don't know how to respond to these situations. You get the idea? 1973, we don't have sophisticated SWAT teams. They didn't have a SWAT team in Sweden until 1987. One of the people I've been talking to about this is a senior Swedish police officer who was there at the time. And I'll show you what he had to say about the events at the end. But he, we, we talked a lot about this, and he really likes to talk about it because he sees the injustice done to Christine and the other hostages, and he sees the, how, what the role the police paid, played in that, which I'll come to. Okay, so here's what happened. Janne Olsen, a minor thug, walks into the bank in Normalstor Central Handelsbanken in central Stockholm with a submachine gun to rob the bank. He gets in there and says, you know, give me the money. Someone trips the alarm. Before he can leave the bank, the police show up. 
sirens are going, please show up. So now he's got a problem. What do I do? So he decides to take hostages. Boom, 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 boom. He shoots plaster off the roof. It falls down. People hit the ground. He yells at people to hit the ground. He runs up to the back, slightly raised level of the bank where Christine Enmar, two other women, and one man are working. The man is in the toilet. Christine hears the gunshots. She runs for the nearest cover, which is underneath the desk. She says, the desk was about that high off the ground. I got underneath it. <laughs> so she's underneath the desk. He comes up. He finds her. He's got, he's got the three women. He's got them at gunpoint. Then the guy sort of accidentally comes out of the bathroom. He finds some cord of some kind. He tells the guy to tie them up, sets up chairs, and he's down behind them between Christine and Lisbeth with a submachine gun waiting for the cops. And that happens in about two seconds, you know, two minutes flat kind of thing. So you can imagine uh, the experience, right? Now what happens is the police don't know how to, they don't know what's going on, do they? That's not their fault, but they just don't know. So two police officers walk into the bank with their guns drawn. <laughs> and he's sitting up in the back like this. Boom. Hits one guy in the hand, injures him. The gun falls. The guy runs out of the bank. The other guy just stands there like this. So he says, hey, you, get in here. Come down, sit down on the floor. He makes the guy sit down on the floor. All of the other people are face down on the floor like this, except the hostages up at the back. And he says to the cop down there, he says, okay, I want you to sing some Swedish folk songs. Go ahead. So the, car, the cop starts singing Swedish folk songs, or trying to, while he's got a rifle pointed at him uh, in a, between the head of Christine and Elizabeth. You get a sense of the oddness of the whole situation. He stops singing, and then when he stops, one of the people on the floor says, Excuse me, Mr. Robber, can we leave now? And he says, Oh, yes, all of you people down there, get out of here. So they all run out of the bank. Now there's just four of them left. Janne Olsen, Lisbeth, Brigitte, uh, Christine, and I forget the young man's name. Anyway, so now the police, they've got some witnesses, eh? So they decide, they figure it out, we know who this guy is. They think they know who he is, but he's not who they think he is. So they have a, they have a case of mistaken identity. So they decide, okay, we know who this guy is from the description and from the criminals they think are in the area. So they, they, they go and find, they find out that this guy, who they think it is, has a brother in Stockholm. So they go, okay, let's go get his brother. We'll bring his brother down to the bank, and his brother will negotiate with us. So they go find the brother. They drag the brother down to the bank, and they say, okay, you've got to negotiate with your brother to come out here. They walk into the bank. Niels Beyerulf, the criminologist psychiatrist who invented the term Stockholm Syndrome, is walking beside him into the bank. He's the consultant for the police. He's in charge of the police response. He's walking into the, uh, you know, with the guy. And they go, hey, your brother's here. We've come to talk. Boom. Shoots over their heads. Oh, my God, he would even kill his brother. <laughs> they go running out of the bank. Christine doesn't know it's not his brother. He knows it's not his brother. No one else knows it except the brother, I guess. <laughs> it's not his brother. <laughs> but, but so now it's all over the radio. The police, the, the TV has arrived. It's the radio. It's a media circus. There's people outside. There's snipers in the bushes. Christine sitting in a chair watching the snipers through windows at the top, thinking, okay, if they shoot through those windows, that bullet's going to refract, and there's just as good a chance it's going to hit me as anybody else. You know? And when you think about it, when those police came down those stairs, did her situation get better or worse? Was she more safe or less safe after the police intervened? Less safe. So now what happens is it's all over the media. So the media puts on who the police thought the robber was. It's all over stuff. So friends of this guy hear that it's him, but they know where this non-guy really is. He's a criminal who escaped and he's living in Hawaii. <laughs> so they phone him in Hawaii. <laughs> they phone him and they say, hey, they say that you're holding up all these hostages. <laughs> you have hostages at the bank. You know? And the guy gets pissed off. He doesn't realize that there's an extradition treaty with Hawaii. So he phones Sweden going, hey, it's not me. I'm in Hawaii. <laughs> How can you say anything to <laughs> So they extradite him and he goes to jail in Sweden. Happy is, uh... Okay, now, Jan Neff, 
uh, has not been out of jail very long, and he has a friend who's still in jail. His friend is ca called Clark Olofsson. Now, Clark Olson is today married to one of the two or three wealthiest women in the Netherlands. He's doing fine. And I know that because the police officer in Sweden I talked to is the head of international crime. So he's kept an eye on this guy. <laughs> he knows exactly where he is and he, who he's connected to. So he's doing really, he's doing really fine. I asked, um, I asked Christine about Clark Olson, and she goes, yeah, Clark Olson, he was really interesting. I said, what do you mean? She said, well... He looked like a cross between Che Guevara and Jesus Christ. <laughs> I said, you're telling me he was pretty hot. She goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what happens is, young Ed decides, I'm going to have to get some sleep. This isn't ending anytime soon. What am I going to do? So he calls out and he talks to Niels Bayerot, and he says, I want you to go get Clark Olson out of prison, and I want him to come into the bank. So, so Niels Bayer wrote, goes, okay. So they go to prison, and they find Clark Olofsson, who tried to escape two weeks previously and injured two prison guards. So they get him up now, but this guy is a criminal's criminal. He's suave, he's smart, he's sophisticated. He's in jail, so something went wrong, but he's a criminal's criminal. <laughs> you know, they love him. And there's a, there's a pecking order, right? So... Anyway, the police go and talk to Clark, and they say, Okay, Clark, listen, um, when you go into that bank, you work for us. Just remember that. And if you don't, at the end of this, if you help this all end well, we'll make sure that things go well for you. So they make it, they strike a deal. So he comes into the bank. Yonette doesn't know that they've struck a deal, but he's got his buddy Clark there, who has some brains. <laughs> so Clark's in the bank. So Clark looks for an opportunity, and he takes aside the hostages, and, and Christine told me what he said to her. He, within a few hours, he found a way to take her aside privately and said, hey, look, no matter what happens, I will not let him hurt you. So she says to me, you know, at that moment, I believed him. I said, you believed him, or you decided to believe him? I decided to believe him. Why? She said, it was crazy. They were going to, something was, I was going to get killed. We were all going to get killed. I had to believe somebody. So she made a tactical decision. So, and the reason she had that question is because oh, I believed him. That would be like a symptom of Stockholm Syndrome, wouldn't it? You know? So she's wondering, do I have this? It's not so easy to just be so clear that you don't have this syndrome that the rest of the world says you have. You know? So this happened. Where am I? Partway down. Okay. Clark Olofsson enters the scene. Now, this is going to sound really strange, but all of the hostages had phone calls home with their families from the bank vault. Can you imagine? So Christine had a phone call where the, she had been talking. She had a radio interview while she was a hostage on live radio, Swedish radio. They, let her, they were getting newspapers in there. They were listening to radio in the bank. So there was all this kind of weird, you know, it sounds strange, eh? There was all this weird communication going on. And so she had a phone call with her parents. And uh, when she was on radio, they asked her about how, what she thought about things. And she swore a little bit because she was pissed off at the police. So then when she talked to her parents on the phone, they said, they said, Christine, we didn't raise you to be that way, to talk this way. <laughs> they criticized her for swearing. <laughs> she said, oh, it was perfect. It was just like being at home. <laughs> That's exactly what I needed. You know, my <laughs> so anyway, she has a phone call. And uh, now, Yannette Olson has decided that what they need to do is leave the bank because this is not going to end well. So he decides, okay, uh, we're going to we, we're leave the bank. So he's having negotiations with Niels Beirut, who says, no, you can't leave the bank. And he has a negotiation with Olaf Palma, who agrees, no, they can't leave the bank. Christine kind of hears all this going on. She gets pissed off, and she demands to phone Olaf Palma. She phones the Prime Minister of Sweden as a hostage from the bank vault. <laughs> Did you ima imagine that happening? <laughs> and so there's a transcript of that entire 50-minute conversation with, the old, with Olaf Palma. That, but there's something very interesting about it. There's one line of the transcript that has been removed by the Swedish media. 
except for two journalists wrote it down originally at the time, and Christine remembers it as if it was yesterday. Um, and I'll come to that point in the transcript. So my son Nick has a partner called Emily Gustafsson, who is from Orobro, who <laughs> grew up in Sweden. So I got the, tra I got the original recording uh, and have it translated uh, into English. And uh, what Emily had to say is, um, she said, uh, yeah, you know, when you listen to it, it's really amazing. Because Christine, uh, she doesn't sound like she's only 23 years old. You know, she sounds, she's so clear. She's so assertive. She's arguing with Ola Palma. Ola Palma is the one who's fumbling. So, it, uh, so it's, it, she doesn't sound like she's been infantilized, if you know what I'm saying. She's clear as a bell. So I'll play you a couple of bits of, um, I'm going way over time. Am I going way over time? No, you're great. What time is it? That's a bad picture, so I won't talk about it. Anyway, so here it is. <laughs> so I'll come to that point. Now here she is phoning Olaf Palma. Um, <laughs> yes, my name is Christine Enmark, and I'm one of the hostages at Credit Bank, and, and I would like to talk to Olaf Palma. <laughs> <laughs> Receptionist, one moment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Transfer to Prime Minister's office, Ava Leander. Yes, this is Christine Enmark, and I'm one of the hostages here at the bank, and I would like to talk to Olaf Palma. Yes, uh, can you wait a bit? Uh, yes, and then they're, they're discussing, are we going to lose the connection and all this kind of stuff. So it's just so weird and ordinary, isn't it? Yeah. And um, anyway, now this is further on. I've obviously omitted this. It's a long transcript. Fascinating to read. But uh, Christine is arguing with Olaf Palma. She's saying, because she wants to leave the bank with the, the robbers. She's volunteered to leave the bank with the robbers, right? Because for her, the situation is bad and getting worse because the police response is not going so well. And, um, but you, if he sees police in here, he'll shoot. Do you understand that? Uh, Olaf says, okay, he'll shoot at police. He'll just shoot. That's what he said. That's what he said. He'll shoot at his own brother. Because she doesn't know it wasn't his brother. They came down and said that your brother wants to talk to you. And he said, if he comes down, I'll shoot him. And then they sent him down. And if he has said he'll shoot, he'll shoot. He does what he says he will. And by the way, now she's been reading media and listening to radio. And by the way, he's not a desperado. And there are no, now you have to keep in mind that Janet Olson and Clark Olson are listening to her phone conversation, her side of it, with Olaf Palmer. So think about, she knows they're listening to the conversation. Uh, he's not a desperado. There are no nar narcotics in here like it says in the newspaper. There's nobody here using narcotics and no whiskey or other alcohol like it also says in the newspaper. In fact, there are a lot of dumb things written in the newspaper. And he doesn't hold us in a chokehold. He hasn't done a single thing to harm us. She must have Stockholm Syndrome, eh? <laughs> then it goes on, Olaf, he hasn't held you in a chokehold. No, he's held his arm across our chests and he held the submachine gun on the other hand. And of course, if you're sitting 38 meters away, in a bush in Brazili Park, then it might look like a chokehold. But he's never held us in a chokehold. He hasn't done anything to hurt us. So what might she be trying to do here, knowing that these people are listening to her? Could, could she be trying to kind of establish some, you know, connection or, okay, I'm not going to sell you guys out or, you know, just trying to be safer? So yesterday, before Clark got there, he didn't hold you in a chokehold. No, no, no. He tied us up. Actually, he didn't. He didn't tie us up. Another guy did that. And then he sat us up here. He didn't touch us. He sat there the whole time saying, relax, take it easy. That's what he did, honestly. He hasn't tried anything. Not a single chokehold has occurred here. Nothing. So Olaf says, but are you really experiencing the police to be a hostile power? Yes, you know what? I do. Why? Don't you think? And then she cuts him off. And you understand I want out of here, and I trust that they'll drop me off. I do. But why would he drop you off when he won't let you go now? Why would he? Because he wants to get out of the bank. <laughs> and if he has us with him, he knows that nobody will do anything. Nobody will shoot when we're there, right? That's what you've said. Nobody will harm us. Olaf says, no, but the moment this guy puts down the weapon, then nobody's life, then nobody's life is in danger. You must know that. She says, no, of course I understand that. But he wants out of the bank. He has a little money here that he wants out. So you see what's happening? She's trying to argue, saying, hey, now here's what happens where it gets strange. And then she says to him, if you were in my shoes, then you would, and if I were prime minister, then you're darn tootin', you would be calling me and asking me for the exact same thing. I know that. She's 
like, uh, that's not necessarily true. Yes, it is. <laughs> because I'm not so sure I would believe them. You know, interesting, eh? Uh, the problem is her belief for something now. As we're going along, yeah, 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 you would. And now there's background noise, and there's a pause, and here's where the bit that Olaf Palma said was taken out of the transcript to protect his reputation. What he actually said here was to proceed. Well, Christine, you can't get out of the bank. You will have to content yourself that you will have died at your post. Oh. You can see why they took it out. So, Lisbeth, who's sitting beside her, overhears this, and Lisbeth says, there are plenty of dead heroes. And then Christine says, I don't want to be some dead hero. Now, there they are in the, in the vault. There's uh, Che Guevara, Jesus Christ. Our <laughs> so, that's an interesting moment, eh? So now when Christine tells me this, when we're talking, the first time we met, she goes, come here, I want to show you something. So we get up off the chairs, we walk over to the other side of her office, look out the window, down on the street. She points to an alleyway about 100 meters away across the street. She says, do you see that alley over there? Yeah, I see that alley. She goes, that's where Olaf Palma was assassinated. I guess he died at his post. No humor. Completely fucking grim. And basically, right? It was like, you fucker. How dare you? How dare you? And now he's been, you know, protected all these years from that. So um, she was just, I ain't taking that shit from nobody. I'm telling you that right now. You know, so it was quite something. Okay. Now I'll cut to the chase here a little bit. Volunteering to go with the robbers. Here's where she says to me, Christine says, you know, I have a question though. Why did I volunteer to go with the robbers? Why did I volunteer? Did, did I have Stockholm Syndrome? I was 23. Did I think it would be fun to go? What was I thinking? Do I have Stockholm Syndrome? And it's a serious question. She's talking. She thinks she's talking to a psychologist, right? So, so I ask her, um, could I ask you a couple of questions about that? She goes, sure. So I ask her, uh, okay, can you tell me about the other hostages? She goes, uh, well, Elizabeth. I said, Elizabeth, yeah, what was she like? She goes, well, she's maybe, she was my age, maybe, uh, but she was very shy, very frail girl. She would come with me, but she wouldn't go on her own with the hostages. I said, okay. What about the other one? She goes, Brigitte. And when she says Brigitte's name, she starts to cry. And I, I said, what's going on? She goes, I forgot about this. And, um, but it's like yesterday. I remember everything about it, but I forgot about it for so long. And I said, what? She goes, I heard, I overheard Brigitte having a phone call, her phone call home. And um, Brigitte's talking to her husband. She says, hello, honey, you know, uh, I'm a hostage in the bank, uh, and I won't be home for dinner. So you're going to have to pick up the girls from school, and uh, they'll be hungry when you pick them up. Uh, there's a little bit of fish in the back of the fridge. But she just has this ordinary phone call. So does that give you a thought about what Christine might have been up to? So I said to her, hang on a second here. You weren't thinking maybe you ought to be the one to leave the bank because you didn't want the mother of these little girls to leave the bank. You didn't want her at risk. You weren't protecting those little girls well, were you? And then she stops and she goes, you know, I had a purpose. Um, I hate to tell you this, but that does not look a lot like Stockholm Syndrome. You know? It looks like you had a reason for doing what you were doing. At the moment, it wasn't that you had fallen in love with the captor. She goes, yeah. <laughs> you know? So then I said, look, can I ask you another question? Where does a... How old were you at the time? She said, I'm 23. How long have you been in Stockholm? Only about a year. Where does a 23-year-old young woman get the wherewithal in a moment like that? Uh, over a period of time like that, where do you get that strength of spirit, that kind of courage, and where does that come from to protect little kids while all this is going on? So I asked her that question, and she goes, well, you know, I'm from the north of Sweden. <laughs> so that's like being from the Yukon. It's like uh, <laughs> where men are men and so are the women. That's what he said. 
no disrespect to either party in that. But if kind of the, the whole notion is you got to do what you got to do. Nobody looks out after you. You take care of business. You, you have to be independent. You have to be strong. You have to look after yourself. So, so I said, okay, you're from the north of Sweden. She goes, yeah, you're not from Sweden. You don't understand. So then I said, yeah, okay. But um, was that the first time in your life that you found yourself in a position where you had to care for little people? She said, well, no. Um, my father, he could drink a lot. And when he drank a lot, he could get he could get kind of crazy for my mom. And my mom, she would get depressed sometimes because she had a child that died. And sometimes she would drink a lot. And so I would have to look after my little sisters. So the whole idea of just paying attention to these little girls and looking after them for you was just, just what you do. She was, yeah. It was just a natural thing for her to think about that. Uh, so there was a whole bunch of things going on there. Now, um, I'll just move along. There's lots of funny parts to this, but I'll skip over for now. Now, there she is again. There's that photograph. What happened at the very end of the hostage taking is they got a six and a half days. The police got a tube that came into the bank hole, a little tiny tube, and they put gas in, and they gassed everybody. And then they came in, after everyone was gassed and laying on the floor gasping, they came in and they handcuffed Clark all of you. And after they handcuffed him, they started putting the boots to him and beating him up. Christine's watching this. Now, this is the guy that said, I'll make sure no one hurts you. So anyway, he's, he had been the major force for safety in the whole experience. And then, then there's, there's two guys. I imagine they're like my high school buddies. This is how I think about these guys. Like, just a bunch of goofballs like me. So there's two guys down at the call center the police call center. They're like the only two police in Sweden, probably, or Stockholm probably, that weren't at the bank. So they get a message over the radio, the hostage taking is over. It's time, you know, we've saved the hostages, and it's all, yay, you know. So these guys go, hey, we ought to go down there. <laughs> That's what I mean. It's like, like let's go. <laughs> so they get into it, they find a car, they get in a cart, they go ripping down to the bank, they get to the bank, they got the uniforms on, right? So then they walk into the bank, and, uh, you know, like this, they walk into the bank, and the, the police guy I've been talking to said these guys were prima donnas then. They were prima donnas their entire career. They were like a laughing stock of the police force because of what they did. So they walk into the bank, and they're sort of leaning up against the post being held by another policeman is Janet Olsen, handcuffed. So they walk in, and they tell this other policeman, hey, we got it. So the other policeman, you know, okay. So they get him on one arm each. They take him out of the bank. You know, it was all the public. It's packed out there this park, and they parade up and down the street, <laughs> like this, like they, they, you know, they protect, they're parading up and down the street like this, and people are applauding the police, and boo, they're hissing at Yannette Olsen. Christina's watching this, right? And she's thinking, you fuckers, you just about got me killed, like, now you're parading up and down the street like your heroes? She's pissed off. So now when they come in, the ambulance people all, they say, okay, lie down on the stretcher. She goes, I walked in here six and a half days ago, I'm walking out. They say, no, lie down, no. This goes on for a while. Finally, she goes, fine. She gets on the stretcher. They say, lie down. She goes, no, lie down, no, lie down, no. They push her down. She sits up. So that is a really indignant young woman who's just seen a whole bunch of mistreatment. The police response was incredibly problematical. As the senior police officer said to me, it is a miracle that they weren't all killed at the time. It was so disorganized. So, there's the map. It's a story of social responses, right? She was resisting the attackers, but she was also, she had to respond to all of the social responses and manage that whole situation. That's really what it's all about. I have this three and a half hour conversation with her. I leave there, and you can imagine, I'm like, holy shit, what just happened? So I go for a walk down the street in Stockholm, and I walk up onto this mountain. There's a church there, a hill there. Linda and I have been there together. And uh, they said, sit down. I stood up. <laughs> Click. <laughs> That's the, we've been talking with Christine about that. So then what happens is she gets interviewed on the radio almost right away. And they ask her, what do you think about all of this? And what happened? And she goes, you know, the robbers never hurt us. And um, um, but, you know, the police, Niels Beirut, I saw him. He was shaking like a little schoolgirl. The police, so she got angry at the police response. At that moment, 
They interviewed Niels Mayer Roth, who said, ah, you can't listen to her. She has Norman Storr syndrome. She has Stockholm syndrome. That's when Stockholm syndrome was invented. To silence a really angry young woman who just been dealing with really ineffective state responses and dealing with a lot of violence. She went and saw a female psychiatrist. A couple of hours later, the first question the female psychiatrist asked her was, did you have sex in the bank vault with Clark Olison? First question. She goes, fuck off. She went back and talked to her a little while later, and she said that woman actually became quite helpful to her. But that was the first question she got asked, the bank vault. So Stockholm Syndrome, um, is an insult invented to silence an angry young woman. It has nothing to do with the events whatsoever. It's a complete house of cards. And um, this is what the senior police guy had to say. Um, the police response was completely disorganized. The police in Sweden did not take up, wake up until the assassination of Alma Palma. One of the things, here's the thing I, I love. Because we were so certain about Stockholm Syndrome, it's a gender thing, actually. It's quite easy to silence a woman just by saying these things. Spot on. And none of the hostages have really been heard. It's a failure of the Swedish justice system, I think. So he wants to talk about this because he feels that there's some giving back to Christine needs to be done. So you can see why I didn't want to start talking about it too much. The last thing she needs is another male talking head making up theories about her. She is working on a book right now with a... Uh, journalist who she's known for 30 years and um, that book I think is in its last stages of completion I'm trying to convince her to get it translated into English because I think it could be a really really important document you know so uh, that's it Stockholm Center